The New York Mets finally won their first series of the season. Can they keep things rolling in Atlanta? We'll discuss about all of it on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Ficklestein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use the code all in lowercase. Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Now, this was a very good series for the Mets. They were in all three games. They got leads in all three games. And the first one, they're able to hold it down. The final one, they're able to hold it down. The second one was a little bit of a disaster. I did break down the first game of this series on a podcast Saturday. So if you didn't catch that one, that's where I got into everything that happened on Friday night in the Apple TV Plus game. Saturday was a fun game to watch until it wasn't. Luis Severino threw the ball pretty well. He had one bad inning. That was in the second. Gave up two runs. One of them was unearned because Jeff McNeil made an error. Uh, In that inning, he gave up two hits. He also walked two. Uh, He had a sacrifice fly that he gave up, and that's when he, after that, walked another batter to load the bases. But he did get out of that jam with a great strikeout. He struck out seven in five innings pitch. And overall, I think he looked really good. I mean, the first inning, one, two, three frame. The third and the fourth innings, also one, two, three innings. There was a stretch when you look at the last out of the third through the first two outs of the fifth, where he retired nine batters in a row. Uh, he then gave up a two out triple in that fifth inning, but then got another big strikeout to strand that runner as well. So he stranded a lot of runners in scoring position. His fastball looks great. I'm very encouraged with what I've seen from Severino. And I mean, obviously the first start wasn't great, but If you go back to the day I recorded that show, I wasn't overly concerned. There was a lot of soft hit balls. I just felt like this stuff didn't look terrible. He didn't have his slider in that game. And I thought that was the biggest problem. Again, what we've seen so far is it has been some struggles with his other pitches. Uh, Jolly Olive, who does the Shea Station podcast for for John Boy, I saw he tweeted this. So I want to acknowledge that that's where I saw it first. He mentioned the run value on Severino's fastball this year and run value is a stat that really measures what happened. Okay. So it's an outcome based stat. If you give up a three run Homer on the fastball, that's going to negatively impact your run value. If the bases are loaded and get a big strikeout with your fastball, that's going to positively impact your run value. The run value on his fastball right now is three. The, um, and it's also minus one on his sinker, but his four seam fastball in particular has a run value of three right now. His changeup and his sweeper have a run value of minus two. So those are the pitches that have hurt him. I'm trying to look through my notes here. I know I did mark it. Uh, where was it here? I know I marked Severino's, the batting average against. I can't find it in my notes, so my apologies. I believe that the batting average against his fastball was 211. I know it was in the low twos. And the batting average against his changeup and his sweeper were in the Uh, high 600s. So those are the pitches that he's got to iron out, but I think he can find those. The fact that his fastball is not getting killed after it got destroyed last year, really good sign. So Severino, overall, nice start, but he needed 99 pitches to get through five innings. Now, when he left, he had a 5-2 to lead because the Mets scored four runs in the fourth. Brett Beatty with a single that inning, Starling Marte drew a walk. Jeff McNeil hit by a pitch that loaded the bases. With two outs in the inning, Omar Narvaez got a base hit that scored two. Then Brandon Nimmo drove in two with a double. So that was their big inning. The fifth inning came around. Stalin Marte got a base hit. He stole second. And then Tyrone Taylor hit a double that drove him in. So right there, that's five runs. Bottom of the sixth inning, Jake Diekman comes on. Didn't look good. He got two quick outs on six pitches. But then he walks Ellie De La Cruz on five pitches. He hit Spencer Steer. 
uh, gives up a base hit that scores one. And then with runners at first and third, the Mets fell for a little league play, the double steal. After the game, both Omar Narvaez and Jeff McNeil indicated that the call to throw straight through came from the dugout. So if that was a Carlos Mendoza call or anybody on that bench, a really bad decision, especially with Narvaez behind the plate. I think the runners are eight for eight against them so far this year. He's just a free pass to second. If it's Alvarez, I could justify it a little bit more because maybe you have a chance to throw out that runner and get out of that inning. And I will say, because the bullpen was so taxed, maybe they were just trying to steal outs because if Deakman gets through that quicker, potentially you can steal another out in the following inning with him. But it doesn't work out. The double steal ends up coming into effect where you throw straight through, and I think it was Spencer Steer at that point could just walk home. Then all of a sudden, a 5-3 game, because he ends up striking out the batter, turns into a 5-4 game, and that margin gets even thinner. Johan Ramirez looked great in the seventh, but in the eighth inning, he was gassed, and they had to use him for 53 pitches. You look up when the dust settled from that disaster of an inning where they were just basically hanging him out to dry because you know, they didn't really have any other options. They could have gone to Jorge Lopez, but he was being set aside to potentially save a game. So they ended up just leaving Ramirez out there. He gives up five runs. And the game got away from the Mets. Now, here's the thing. I don't necessarily fault the Mets for that for this reason. Okay, I was going to blame the front office. Because how do you go into a game with only three relievers? Not being able to have Brooks Raley, Adam Adovino, Edwin Diaz. I think Drew Smith was also unavailable. So they just had nobody. How could you do that? Here is the thing. You look at the 40-man roster rules, and we'll talk about these more in the next segment as well, but they limit you to be able to call guys back up that were optioned to start the season. So even though Reed Garrett has an option, the Mets couldn't just option him down and call up Grant Hartwig. Now, on Friday, they'll be able to do that, but they were handcuffed there. So they would have had to make another move on their 40-man roster to add somebody else to, to call a Cole Solcer, for example and get a fresh arm. They could have done that, but I understand how tough it is. You also could say, why did they make the, the Julio Tehran signing official? Well, because I think Tehran was their break glass in case of emergency arm, and you had to add him at some point. So I think that was really how they, they wanted to go about it. You didn't want to just for one game cost yourself a pitcher that you like. Let's just say it was Johan Ramirez potentially or Sean Reed Foley that you would have had a DFA to make that other move. And again, I mentioned this on a Saturday show. If they believed that Kodai Senga was not going to return until June, I think they would have just moved into the 60 and gave themselves some more roster flexibility. Maybe they think they can get him back middle of May. So with that in mind, I'm okay with it. It's a frustrating loss. It's basically a schedule loss, but ultimately the team played well. They got a, a solid enough start from Severino. They put up, Six runs because they scored in the ninth inning as well. Brett Beatty with an RBI hit late. You know, they did a lot of things well. They just didn't have the cards to win that one. Otherwise, you know, they might have swept this series. So you, know, you look at what the Mets have done since that opening series and really that first game against the Tigers where they blew it in extra innings. And obviously they blew the second game in extra innings as well. But even that doubleheader, right? Or even you no know, Let's go back to the first game of the tire series. At least they were in it. But to me, since the rain, from the doubleheader through now, this team is playing much better baseball. Um, two teams that are probably worse than the Brewers, and now they're going to get a real test against the Braves, and they could get smacked around. And we'll talk about that briefly in the final segment. But overall, I think this team's in a much better place. I want to talk about the win because – Again, it was a very similar game on Sunday. Sean Mania threw the ball well. The difference was he had a good bullpen behind him, and the Mets had some offense. So I want to touch on that game a little bit and then also just discuss what I think is a winning combination that's starting to form here that could be repeatable moving forward. So we'll get to all of that stuff in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. 
It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less than on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Now the baseball season is back. You can add your favorite players from the diamond into your prize picked entries. Now, whether it's uh, strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, you can find all of those stats. Let's say you buy into Francisco Lindor's breakout on Sunday. You can go in there and take more on his RBIs. Maybe you want to do that on Tuesday when the Knicks are playing again. He can actually go cross sports. So you can have Lindor's RBIs on Tuesday with Jalen Brunson's points. Take more on both. PrizePix has something for every sports fan from baseball to basketball to League of Legends and everything in between. And again, you can pick on all those different sports in the same entry. With quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and enormous selection of players and stat types, PrizePix is the number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the prize picks app today. Use the code all in lowercase LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So on Sunday, the Mets finally won their first series of the season. And also, Francisco Lindor finally had a good game. The first inning, he hit a double. Rip one down the third base line. It was nice to see Lindor bat from the right side against the lefty Andrew Abbott. Uh, so then he was on second base. You had Nimmo got out. Alonzo got out. Alvarez came up with two outs. And he ripped one right at Christian Encarnacion Strand, the first baseman, who laid out, deflected it off his glove. Was really a, a perfect chance for San Santiago Espinal, the second baseman, to field it, make a play on Alvarez at first. Alvarez was booking it down the line. He might have beaten it if the throw was online. He might have. I think Espinal probably throws him out, but regardless, the throw was wide, and that allowed Lindor to come in and score. That was the only run the Mets scored in that inning. In the second inning, sort of wasted an opportunity because they loaded the bases. Uh, Starling Marte drew a walk. Tyrone Taylor and Jeff McNeil each got on with bunt base hits, and you thought they were going to finally blow a game wide open. It just didn't happen. They hit it to some bad luck. Harrison Bader lined out, hit the ball very hard. Uh, Brandon Nemo did get hit by a pitch, so that allowed them to score the second round of the game. But then Francisco Lindor hit into a double play ball. I know that that's uh, the worst thing you could do in that spot. I also know he hit that ball 103 miles per hour off the bat. So while frustrating, I just like the Lindor start to square up some baseballs. And then we saw that again because in the, was it the third inning? No, fourth inning, sorry. Uh, Lindor homer. And, and that gave the Mets their third run Overall, the last two games of the series, nine hits on Saturday, 11 hits on Sunday, uh, 10 additional base runners from walks and hit by pitches. So across the two games, 30 base runners combined. That's going to help them start to put runs on the board. Obviously, three runs on Sunday isn't great. Six runs on Saturday is. But I imagine if they can keep getting that much traffic on the bases, the floodgates should open at some point. Now, on the pitching side, like I said, it was a little bit of a repeat situation. Shaw Mania could only get the Mets through five, and it's funny because he was going to be the headline of the show today. Through the first two innings, he looked disgusting. Cruised through, only needed 25 pitches, and the title of the show is going to be something like Shaw Mania, or do the Mets have their new ace in Shaw Mania? Because that's how good he looked. But then Luke Maley takes him to 13 pitches. He did strike out, but... That really drained his pitch count. And overall, in that third inning, he needed 29 pitches. He also hit Bubba Thompson, hit Jonathan India on an 0-2 count. So really put himself in a lot of trouble. There was a double steal that put two runners in scoring position, but he got some big strikeouts of Spencer Steer and Christian Encarnacion Strand. The last one, of course, had both of those runners in scoring position. So really pivotal that he got out of that one. In the fourth inning, Again, ran into trouble, 27 pitches, walked two, gave up a hit, hit a batter. Only one run came in on a sacrifice fly, um, but he was able to escape a bases loaded situation with a huge double play. Again, it was Brett Beatty coming up big with the glove, you know, charging a ball, cutting it off early, making the perfect throw to second. His confidence on defense is soaring right now, so that's awesome to see, and, and that helped get Manaya through five. He did have a solid fifth inning, you know, one, two, three frame, only needed 12 pitches, but the damage was already done from those two bad innings in the middle. 92 pitches, they had to pull him. Luckily, arrested bullpen. Jorge Lopez pitched a scoreless sixth, worked around a walk. Brooks Raley, a scoreless seventh, worked around two walks. 
Then Adam Adovino, one, two, three, eighth with a couple of strikeouts. And Edwin Diaz, same thing. One, two, three, ninth with two strikeouts. Got another save. So really solid pitching, particularly from the bullpen. And that leads me into the winning combination I think the Mets are going to have this year. I think their bullpen is going to be really good. With Lopez, Rayleigh, Adovino, and Diaz. Those are four guys right now that I trust in that pen. And Drew Smith has not given up a run this year, at least not an earned run. He has one run allowed. It was unearned. So he's still sporting a zero ERA. That's five guys that you pretty much trust right now. Jake Diekman has not looked good, but he's only pitched three times. His control's still not there. This is a guy that can be hot and cold. So you sort of have to ride out the cold stretches. And then, I mean, if what happens last year can reoccur with what he did with the Rays, he'll lock in for a couple stretches and he could be absolutely lights out, striking out the world. So, the Mets have six veteran good options in this bullpen right now. And then the other two spots are going to be cycled throughout the year. And that's going to be opened up a lot when you get to Friday, where that first option window where you optioned everyone down finally goes away. So in the instance of what we saw this weekend, after Garrett threw the 45 pitches or whatever it was in that double header, the Mets could have optioned him and brought up Grant Hartwig. And then Hartwig could have been that other man in the bullpen for a little bit. It was just a confluence of events between the rain out, doubleheader, and just the way that that bullpen got taxed that put them in such a bad spot. Two extra inning games as well. Those didn't help. So now you move forward and you say, all right, right now they got Reed Garrett and Johan Ramirez as those mop-up guys. And Garrett has the optionality. So eventually they'll be able to go to Hartwig, Josh Walker, Colton Ingram is another pitcher that's on the 40 right now. And I did mention this before the season, but I'll reiterate when it comes to options. I know it's a little bit confusing, but here's the rule. Players may only be optioned five times per season, but when they are optioned once that counts for the whole year, they get one, they have an option year early in their career. So they have three option years. So Garrett still had an option year based on his service time. So he can be up and down five times. Same thing with Hartwig. Same thing with Ingram, with uh, Josh Walker. Let's just say at some point the Mets decide to DFA a Max Cranick or a Sean Reed Foley off of their injured list. Or if they, you know, Johan Ramirez looks bad again and they just decided to DFA him and they wanted to add Nate Lavender to the roster, well, then he'd have five options to play with. So that's how you can really cycle fresh arms at the back two spots of that bullpen. And I think the Mets are going to get there where this pen's going to be really solid throughout the season. So that's the one big takeaway I had is I think that there's going to be a bullpen that can hold on to leads late. And I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by Sean and I and Luis Severino and even Jose Quintana and Adrian Hauser have thrown the ball pretty well. I'm encouraged by the upside of Anaya and Severino and the floor of Quintana and Hauser. I'm curious to see what Tehran looks like, but I love what I saw out of Jose Budo. So that's six options for now. McGill could come back. My one issue with the rotation is getting length out of those guys, and that's going to take a bullpen that's good and tax them to the point where things get difficult. So hopefully they can figure out a way to get some length. I don't know if going to a six-man rotation is the answer because if all these guys are five and dive in the six-man rotation, you're carrying one less reliever, I don't know how helpful that is. I don't know if that's going to put the Mets in a better situation other than maybe having Budo in the bullpen, being a swingman that can come into games, um, that could be a, a benefit or even putting Hauser back into that type of a role that he served in the past. Maybe that's the, the answer for the Mets. I don't know. The other thing that I think has been a positive development, particularly over this weekend, is the lineup is starting to take shape because Alvarez and Beatty have been great. Francisco Alvarez has a 935 OPS through eight games. Uh, Beatty's hitting 290. The OPS still hovering, I think, in the 740s, if I'm not mistaken, because he hasn't slugged much. It's mostly been base hits. Um, I will say SNY put out a graphic today that was hilarious to me because it said Brett Beatty's last seven games. Like the Mets have played eight games this season. So you're literally just removing an 0 for 3 on opening day. But with that said, outside of that opening day, he's gotten on base every game he has played. He's hit safely in six of his eight starts, opening day being one that he didn't hit safely. And then he had another one against the Tigers in that double header but he still walked and I believe scored the game winning run with that walk. So Brett Beatty's development has been amazing to see. 
he's the everyday third baseman right now. You got to keep him in the lineup at all times um, because he's just giving you a left-handed bat that you desperately need in the middle of that lineup. And right now, until you get J.D. Martinez back, and we'll be talking about that in the next segment here, you got Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Starling Marte. That's a solid one through six. Now, what they're getting out of you know Tyrone Taylor and Harrison Bader, as well as Jeff McNeil, DJ Stewart, yeah, that leaves something to be desired, although I am encouraged by the at-bat that Taylor is taking. And Bader did have a better series here and hit the ball hard a couple of times. Um, Jeff McNeil, it still looks like he's a little bit lost. The one home run on Friday night was great, but the rest of it of his, of his at-bats just haven't been. Stewart's a lost cause, and that's what we're going to get to the next segment here. With J.D. Martinez potentially not coming back even this week, did the Mets make a mistake with how they set up their roster to handle this stretch without him? I'm going to go through that and give you a little bit of a preview of the series against the Brewers in just a minute. Before we get to that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And what I love about Game Time is you pull up the app and you can see all of the nearby events. So over the weekend, if you don't know what to do, or you're like, I really want to get out tonight. You can just see what's going on around you. And also, Game Time has a great offer right now for baseball fans, not just new users, all baseball fans. For a limited time, you get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with the code first pitch. And when you use the game time app, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you know, Atlanta, this upcoming weekend here, it's upcoming week, I should say, uh, you can look at all the different seats and, and decide, you know, get, pick out a seat, look at the view where you'll be sitting, get an idea uh, of what you're looking at. If that's a seat you want to buy all in pricing up front. So you know exactly what to expect, no hidden fees, anything like that. So if you want to take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, Use the Game Time app with the code First Pitch. You're gonna get twenty dollars off any MLB purchase of one hundred and fifty dollars or more. Terms apply. Again, that's code First Pitch for twenty dollars off from March twenty fifth to April fourteenth only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And before this season, when we knew that JD Martinez would take a minor league assignment before starting with the New York Mets, I had April eighth today circled in pen as that's where J.D. Martinez will make his season debut. He is going to be part of that series against the Braves. I think that was the most optimistic timeline that you could have because oh, the earliest he was eligible was Sunday, and that didn't seem likely to have him just end up out there for one game in Cincinnati. But he was in Port St. Lucie on the backfields, really trying to ramp himself up quick. He got into some games with the St. Lucie Mets over the weekend, played on Friday and Saturday, what, one for eight, with a walk, but did hit a lot of balls um, over 100 miles per hour. So he thought, all right, you know, maybe he plays Sunday and is ready to go for Monday. Again, in the best possible outcome, but he needed a couple days to rest. He did not play on Sunday. The St. Lucie Mets have Monday off. And Carlos Mendoza said he needs more time. He's resting with overall body soreness. He's 36 years old, and he didn't get a spring training. So he's been trying to fit in a spring training in essentially two weeks. He needs more time. These guys typically need a full month at least, um, if not you know, six to eight weeks that spring training typically will give these guys, especially if they show up in a pitchers and catchers report. They get really two months. And so for J.D. Martinez at his age, he's going to need at least another week, I think, here. And you know, when you really look at it, if he takes Tuesday off too, that's the first game the St. Lucie Mets are back. Typically, they'll play you know Tuesday through Sunday against one team. So they're playing in Jupiter, which is not far from St. Lucie. All week. So if he takes off Tuesday too, I'll be a little bit concerned because that's two days off. So if he's not ready to go after two days off, I'd be worried. I, I could understand if this guy's been pushing his body nonstop on the that field into games. He played two games and he's just like, all right, this I can't do this. You know you have an off day on Monday, so you get 48 hours to really cool off. I hope he plays on Tuesday. And then maybe he plays Wednesday and then gets Thursday off and then tries to play Friday, Saturday, maybe even Sunday just to see where he's at. If he can get through those games and feel good, maybe you see him at some point for that series against the Pirates. I'd say the most optimistic timeline now would be next Monday against the Pirates. But there's a chance that we don't even see him there. 
And if you don't see him there, when does JD Martinez join the Mets? After they play the Pirates at home? Well, at first they play. Okay, so they play the Braves for four. They play the Royals over the weekend. Then they play the Pirates to start next week. That's the homestand, Royals, Pirates. And they have an off day, and then they go out west. So could he go back and play in that Dodger stadium that he loved so much last year? Maybe that's the best place for him. He's got an off day before you know they make that trip, which they'll obviously travel um, you know, after the the, you know, the Pirates series, after that game on Wednesday. So he could you know, potentially play th- this week in St. Lucie, then go out and, and play in Brooklyn for a little bit, right? Get a couple more games under him or at least one more game under him take some time, hop on the team plane, head out to, to uh, LA for the Dodger series. And then you have him for the Dodger series and the giant series. That would be a, a fairly optimistic timeline, even, or even worse. He doesn't even join the Mets for that trip. And then I think you're looking at April 26th. So if that ends up being the case, that would be 25 games into the season without JD Martinez. That's rough. And that brings me back to the opening day roster decision. The Mets decided to put Mark Vientos in Syracuse and roster DJ Stewart. And at the time, I understood why they did it because Mark Vientos struck out 19 times in 19 games in spring training. And I think overall, they weren't sure how well his bat would play. They knew that he wasn't going to be part of this roster when J.D. Martinez joined the team. And so they sort of just ripped off the Band-Aid. With that said, do I believe Mark Vientos would be giving the Mets better at bats than DJ Stewart is right now? Not a very high bar to climb. DJ Stewart's 0 for 10 with six strikeouts. Now, in the first scenario, let's say that J.D. Martinez comes back next Monday. That's 16 games into the season. If he comes back for the Dodgers series, that's 19 games into the season. And again, if it's the worst case scenario, 25 games into the season. Regardless of the scenario that now is in front of the Mets, Mark Vientos could have made an impact in that time. There was pinch hit opportunities where he could have come in and maybe provided a jolt with one swing. There's games where DJ Stewart started that Mark Fiantos could have come in and who knows, put up a home run. Lefty today, Andrew Abbott. Could Mark Fiantos have homebird in today's game? Potentially. Okay, so I, I know people don't want me to point to this the triple A numbers. He's hitting 320, 323 right now in, in triple A with a 400 on base percentage. Has two home runs, two doubles, 981 OPS. They want to say, okay, don't, don't look at that. That's easy pitching. That's not major league pitching. And I get that. With that said, G-Man Choi was in a competition with DJ Stewart to the very end when it came to making this roster. And if they didn't sign J.D. Martinez, I think G-Man Choi would have made the team. But because they signed Martinez, it didn't make sense to take Stewart off the roster or somebody else off the roster just to add Choi for what could have been a 10-game stint. And so they put Choi in Syracuse. G-Man Choi is hitting 160 in Syracuse right now with the 267 on base and a 160 slug. Again, it's AAA numbers. But the point to me is if DJ Stewart was in AAA, would he have a 981 OPS? I don't know. I don't think so. And Mark Fientos did hit five home runs in spring. So when you look at it that way, I just feel like there's a couple of games this year Vientos, you know, might not have, you know, played great overall, but could he have turned a game or two for you? Potentially. And I don't know if Stewart's going to do that. And in that case, I think the Mets missed an opportunity to see Vientos for three weeks against big league pitching and to maybe squeak out an extra win or two. So I, I think ultimately because Martinez is taking longer than maybe they expected, it ends up blowing up in their face a little bit. Hopefully. Look, this is just one last week. You can play Tyrone Taylor and Harrison Bader a little bit more. Maybe you get Joey Wendell or Zach Short an extra game. You can potentially stay away from DJ Stewart, rely more on defense, use the DH spot to give Marte a blow, Nimmo a blow. Um, you know, Maybe even you want to get crazy and give Lindor a day off his feet, let him DH, take that off his mind, and start Zach Short at shortstop for a game even. So you, you can play with that DH spot, even go with two catchers. The games that you have Nervais in there, you can DH Alvarez. There's ways that they can use this, and it's fine, and it doesn't matter too much, but it does feel like they're playing a bat short right now, and I feel like Vientos would have been better than some of the other options that they have. 
Don't know if he'd be great, but I feel like he at least has a better chance to run into a baseball than pretty much anybody in the Mets bench right now. I digress on that because there's still some more stuff I want to discuss. The series against the Braves coming up here. Four games in Atlanta. Could be really rough. <laughs> okay. The Mets are fortunate that they don't have to face Spencer Strider in this series, although that's bad for baseball. Um, we'll see if Strider is only out for a couple of weeks with a sprained UCL, but he's getting other opinions with doctors. It could be much worse. When it comes to this series, uh, we'll talk about the rest, you know, Tuesday through Thursday on tomorrow's show. I'll have more time to give you a fuller series preview. So I just want to preview tonight's game. Julio Tehran will make his Mets debut, and he's going up against Charlie Morton, who at times in the past has given the Mets fits. We'll see how they fare against him this year. Uh, Reed Garrett, fully rested. Right, He last pitched on Thursday, gave the Mets 45 pitches, so he did not pitch all weekend. Garrett is going to follow Tehran, I'd imagine, depending on how long Tehran can go. This is a tax bullpen again because as much as uh, the Mets would love to go to that combination of Lopez, Rayleigh, uh, Adovino, and Diaz again, but I don't want to pitch these guys you know, four games in five days. As much as they hate going to guys three days in a row, Four and five days is really just as bad. So I don't expect to see Rayleigh, Diaz, or Adovino. Maybe one of them, you know, if they look at Diaz's pitch count and they say, you know what, if we have a chance to win a game, we'll use them. But then you use them, you burn them for the following night or maybe the following two nights. So if I had to guess, those three are probably off the table again this early in the season. So the Mets have the, the deck really stacked against them. They're playing a team that's way better than them. They have Julio Tehran coming aboard, who knows how many pitches he can give them, what he's going to look like in Atlanta's ballpark. And then after Tehran, it's Reed Garrett. You do have Drew Smith on two days rest. You have Jake Diekman on a day's rest. And you have Jorge Lopez, who had two days rest before he pitched on Sunday. So I imagine Lopez is the de facto closer in this one because of his closer experience. Drew Smith, probably your eighth inning guy. And then you're hoping that Reed Garrett and Jake Diekman can carry those middle innings. If the Mets can get a lead in the first five with Tehran on the mound, you never know. They might be able to squeak one out here, but it doesn't look good in this game. Like I said, on tomorrow's show, I will recap the Monday night game and I will preview the rest of the series and give you more of a full look at what lies ahead against the Braves. Who knows? Maybe the, the Braves will announce a starter. Although I believe they called up Alan Winnens um, to take Strider's spot on the roster, but maybe he's just sitting in the bullpen. Before we close the show today, some sad Mets news. Jerry Grody passed away on Sunday. Grody, a Mets Hall of Famer, had a couple of all-star appearances. He was a part of the 1969 Miracle Mets. And it's also really sad because Bud Harrelson passed away earlier uh, this offseason. The Mets are wearing a Bud Harrelson patch. I imagine the honor Grody in some way as well um, to see two guys from the same team um, both passed away the same year. It's really sad, uh, especially for the Mets fans that were around for you know those 1960s to 70s Mets. And Grody was a huge part of those teams. I mean, he was a catcher for arguably the best pitching staff in franchise history with Seaver and Kuzman and Nolan Ryan briefly and Matlack. I mean, he was the guy behind the dish for all of that. Joined the Mets in 1966 played through 1977 with the Mets, parts of 12 seasons. Um, you know, Gold Glover, actually not Gold Glover, should have been, uh, but two-time All-Star. And you really look at Mets franchise history, the top catchers ever, it always is going to start with Mike Piazza, I mean, greatest offensive catcher in MLB history. Gary Carter gets that acknowledgement next because he was a Hall of Fame player that had a window with the New York Mets, and he was part of a, championship team and the one that I think fans especially nowadays are the most fond of the 86 Mets but Grody is right there with those guys and you know clearly you know, a top three catcher in Mets franchise history so a big loss uh, for this franchise very sad news um, so I'm sure the Mets will come out with uh, some stuff for their next homestand where they're going to honor Grody as well and uh He'll be honored with Bud Harrelson, I would believe, for the rest of the season. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. I appreciate all of you who continue to tune in every day. Uh, if you don't want to miss tomorrow's show and you're listening on the audio side, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're trying to make a push to 9,000 subs, so appreciate all of you 
who subscribe. Follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen or your first watch every day. Now, for your second watch, head over to YouTube. Check out the first ever 24 7 streaming channel that covers everything in the world of sports. Of course, I'm talking about Locked On Sports today with your local experts from each team and your league wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports today streaming 24 7 on YouTube.